Greetings, unsettled souls, and welcome to the Correct Views. Sam I.B. DeGangi doing political commentary for the Media Speaks. And uh, Christelle, our behind-the-scenes queen, there blowing me kisses. Gotta watch how you word that. All right, friends, uh, do me a favor. Whatever you do, uh, hit share on these videos. You wouldn't believe how much that helps us. It helps us immensely. Everybody watching this, just share it one time. Tell one other person about it. We've been seeing an influx of um, subscribers lately, and that's it's been uh, it's been very good. So please share this right now. Just go share it. Huge help. All right, guys. A new street level surveillance project tracks spying technologies used by local law enforcement. When's the last time we had a lead-off story to do some commentary on? That was good news, particularly good news about spying. Um, again, we, we did have a, one show on it, I know, about where certain clothes uh, don't pick up on certain kinds of cameras. Uh, you have to special order them. It's on the site, youtube.com slash the correct views. Well, listen to this. <clears throat> EFF Web Portal provides in-depth resources about license plate readers, biometric collection, and other high-tech surveillance tools. In other words, according to EFF.org here, this l spies on the things that are spying on us and lets you know it's there. This is wonderful, wonderful news. Responding to a troubling rise in law enforcement's use of high-tech surveillance devices that are often hidden from the communities where they're used, the Electronic Frontier Foundation today launched a street-level surveillance project, a web portal loaded with comprehensive, easy-to-access information on police spying tools like license plate readers, biometric collection devices, and stingrays, which is uh, tied into your cell phones. The S <clears throat> SLS Pro eh, that guy, I can talk today. The SLS project addresses an information gap that has developed as law enforcement agencies deploy sophisticated technology products that are supposed to target criminals, but that scoop up private information about millions of ordinary law-abiding citizens who aren't suspected of committing any crimes. That'd be like you and I. Government agencies are less than forthcoming about how they use these tools, and uh, these are some ways that they're going to help us figure it out. It says law enforcement agencies at the federal, state, and local level are increasingly using sophisticated tools to track our cell phone, car, <coughs> cell phone calls, photograph our vehicles, and there's links for all of this in the article, and follow our driving habits. Uh, how many of you like to think about that happening all the time? The government spying on you everywhere. Well, the SLS Project website, where you want to go, went live today with an extensive information on biometric technologies which collect fingerprints, DNA, and face prints, as well as an automated license plate readers, cameras mounted on patrol cars, and on city streets that can scan and record up millions of cars across the country. And again, this is all a breach of your Fourth Amendment rights. You have a right to uh, to not be spied on by your own government. The government works for you. You do not work for the government. You are not a slave to the government. Says the, uh, this is good. Each topic includes explainers, facts, infographics, and links to EFS legal work in courts, its legislatures, about stingrays, drones, I mean everything. It says the public has heard and read so much about the NSA spying but there's a real need for information, and you can find that there at the Street Level Project. Very, very happy to lead off with some excellent anti-spying news. Um, people taking control of their uh, of their privacy again is a very important thing. And again, look at look at how many different uh, hacks and spying have led. We had a general that was thrown out of the uh, army because an affair came out in a uh, in a hack. So the government should not, you know, be in this because they're obviously doing a subpar job with it or they're doing an excellent job if that's what you call blackmail. It's got to be one or the other. CNBC.com, Russia hacks Pentagon computers, NBC citing sources. So let me tell you something. Everybody, unfortunately, gets into this Putin worship. 
Um, when Obama and NATO, which I think is a bad idea, decide to move within striking dish, uh, distance of Mother Arusha, then you find out quickly that Russia starts getting paranoid about it. However, when Russia flies their warplanes into our airspace on the 4th of July, after Putin called the president, we, we sourced all this out, it's not in my head, called the president, wished him a happy 4th of July, and then flew his warplanes into our country, our airspace. Now we got more of what Putin is doing, so please quit making him out like a god. We, uh, we hear so many things about the KGB, and uh, we know that he's directly tied to it. It's common knowledge. I wouldn't be surprised if it's even on Wikipedia. He's got ties to the KGB. Why is everybody here worshiping this man? He's just jockeying for the high horse of the New World Order, too. And if you don't believe it, then look at all the funding that goes there from families that are behind all of the crap that's going on in this country. A lot of them are the same people. U.S. officials tell NBC News that Russia launched a sophisticated cyber attack against the Pentagon's Joint Staff Unclassified Email System which has been shut down and taken offline for nearly two weeks. According to officials, the sophisticated cyber intrusion occurred sometime around July 25th and affected 4,000 military and civilian personnel who work for the Joint Chief Staff. <coughs> so I guess it's only America that starts wars, right? It, it, it's not Russia. It, it's okay when they do it, right? Just, just because our country has crappy leaders, it's okay for Russia to speak to hack into our computers. We shouldn't be upset at all, right? He, Putin's a wonderful person. Sources tell NBC that it appears the cyber attacker relied on some kind of automated system that rapidly gathered massive amounts of data and within a minute distributed all of the information to thousands of accounts on the internet. The officials also report the suspected Russian hackers coordinated the sophisticated cyber assault via encrypted accounts on social media goes on that it's not clear whether the attack was sanctioned by the Russian government or conducted by individuals. But given the scope of the attack, it was clearly the work of a state actor, the official said. So, I mean, you don't see, you don't see Putin out there condemning it, right? You'd think if he was innocent, he would, he would at least condemn it. Friends, this is, this is not good. Uh, the, the Cold War almost became a hot war. And again, if it does, it's a matter of nuclear weapons. It's a matter of a very very bad time to be alive if that were to be the case. Um, this is from Liberty Blitzkrieg, Michael Krieger, American oligarchy. What's that mean? A very small number of people um, in control of everything. 400 families. Out of, now keep in mind there are there are how many there are um, how many millions of people in the US? How many millions? 400 families represent 50 percent that's half for you Russia fans. Of the money raised by 2016 presidential candidates thus far, half of the money. And what do you think that went? You think that went to, uh, to, to Rand Paul? You think that went to uh, anybody, uh, anybody uh, Mike Huckabee? No, 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 it didn't. Where did it go? I can tell you where it went. It went to Jeb Bush. went to Hillary Clinton. went to Bernie Sanders. went to Marco Rubio went to the puppets that they have stood behind nonstop. That's where it went. It says, ever since I started this website <clears throat> in 2012, writes Michael Krieger, one of my primary objectives was to convince readers that the American system of government is nothing like what we are told in school and via the oligarch-owned mainstream media, that the country has become so captured and corrupted by psychopathic oligarchs that a neo feudal model serfdom was emerging where opportunities to enjoy rising standards of living for the mass majority of people was rapidly becoming a pipe dream. He's very wordy. What's that mean? That so much money and power is being given to such a, such a small number of people who are continually in power based on the donations they get from other people within this small group that nobody else can come up and the, uh, the, the middle class is being destroyed. You, you, you can't be born in, 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 and then come up in America like you used to be able to do. I, I've never seen it in my life. I guarantee most millennials aren't seeing it ever. 
Um, it hasn't happened for a very long time. You tend to be trapped in um, the sub-middle class or worse forever. If you do find a job that pays something, you don't dare leave. Why? Because, among other things, we sent all of the jobs out of sea, overseas. And we did so at the behest of these oligarchs. He writes, I think many readers appreciated my warnings, but it wasn't until an academic study from Princeton that would be a major college for you Lady Gaga fans. And Northwestern came out and factually proved it, that it became undeniable to many people. People. Here's a brief excerpt from the post titled New Reports from Princeton and Northwestern proves it. The U.S. is an oligarchy. Now please, I'm begging you, stop what you're doing and listen to this paragraph. Despite the seemingly strong empirical support in previous studies for theories of majoritarian democracy, our analysis suggests that majorities of the American public actually have little influence over the policies that government adopts. Americans do enjoy many features central to democratic governance, such as regular elections, freedom of speech and association, and a widespread, if still contested, franchise. But we believe that if the policymaking is dominated by powerful business organizations and a small number of affluent, rich, that would be, Americans, then America's claim to being a democratic society are seriously threatened. Um, even Jimmy Carter said it last week, who, finds, who just found out, I think he's in his 90s or something, he's really old, he's got cancer all through him, uh, he, he wasn't given a death sentence, but let's face it, it doesn't look good, although he has beaten it before. He's not my favorite president by any stretch of the imagination. He was terrible for the country, but he was, uh, well, he, he was terrible for the economy. And uh, he didn't handle the uh, hostage taking very well. But he, was a, he would, might have been one of the only really good men that have been president within any kind of uh, even somewhat recent history. And that's not recent. Meanwhile, just today it came out the shocking proof of just how bought and paid for our political system really is. We find out from the New York Times that only 400 families account for nearly half of all the spending for the 2016 presidential election so far. In other words, the Dark Ages, as he was talking about serfdom earlier, like uh, the kings and queens ruling over the lowly, dirty people. New York Times, fewer than 400 families are responsible. And a concentration of political donors is unprecedented in the modern era. A vast majority of the $388 million backing presidential candidates so far this year is being channeled to groups that can accept unlimited contributions in support of candidates from almost any source. The speed of which these super PACs can raise money, sometimes tens of millions of dollars, has allowed them to build enormous campaign war chests. Do you understand what that means, people? 400 families are putting it out there. Let me ask you a question. It doesn't matter if you like him or not. Let me ask you a question real quick. Do you like Mike Huckabee? You have no idea. Name me five things Huckabee believes. You know, you have no idea. But I bet you can probably name five about Jeb Bush. Why? Well, that's because the money is paying for these people to be in the paper. The, the, these people are owning the papers that are donating to get these people in it. Do you see how the game has worked? Where is the widespread prosperity for the country as a whole? Senator Ted Cruz of Texas, a favorite of the Tea Party, has raised the most cash from the fewest donors. And uh, that's dangerous because then those people will have huge, huge advantages over what he does and doesn't do if he was to get in the White House. And that's one of the reasons so many people like Trump. Let's be real. Trump has a lot of money and it's not very likely that you're going to buy him. You would have to threaten him in some way uh, or his family. You're not going to buy Trump. And that's why a lot of people are liking him. It, plain and simple. And many of us like Rand, but let's face it, Rand is running a horrible campaign. Uh, hopefully Jesse Benton will never, ever, ever run a pa campaign for anybody ever. I'm serious. He did a horrible job with Ron Paul's uh, candidacy run, too. Oh, my God. Campaign run. Terrible. 
absolutely terrible. And now he's all but sunk Rand Paul. Rand, Rand looks like whiny and needy. Instead of saying, and I, I, I plan on voting for Rand, rather than saying, hey, does Trump's tax plan appeal to you? Great, because guess who's been saying this for years? But that's not what he's doing. He, he's attacking him and like sounds like he's whining that he gets more of this and more of that. Of course you're going to get cheated, Rand. You're not part of the system, but don't blame it on Donald Trump. You know, and I like Rand more as a candidate than I do Trump, particularly on matters of things like Snowden and whistleblowing, of which Trump thinks you should be put to death. I think uh, uh, Snowden should have his face on the dollar bill for what he's done. But that's neither here nor there. Point is... Benton destroyed Ron Paul's candidacy. He's destroying Rand Paul's candidacy. If you're running for a dog catcher, I would not use Jesse Benton as your campaign manager. I wouldn't want to be ambiguous. Uh, Huntington Park Council appoints two undocumented immigrants as commissioner. CBS LA. This, how is this even legal? It's not legal, let me tell you that. Second of all, will the illegal immigrants need a job? No, they don't. How about the citizens? that went to school there and have put their time and effort into the community <clears throat> and applied for the job and didn't get it. Why did those people get it? Why are we hiring people when we have <clears throat> illegals, when we have people that would be very happy to have this job? This is not uh, uh, doing the job Americans won't do. Listen to this BS. Huntington Park, who, again, I'm not talking into a camera for nothing, <clears throat> contact these boneheads and let them know how happy you are with them. I'm sure they got a Facebook. I'm sure they have a phone number. Huntington Park became the first city in California, thank you, Gary, Gary, Gary Brown, who Dead Kennedys was right about, to appoint two undocumented immigrants, that would be illegal aliens, <clears throat> as commissioners on city advisory boards, a lawmaker confirms. Why is Trump surging? City Councilman Johnny Pineda has picked Francisco Medina to join the Health and Education Commission and Julian Zatarian for the Parks and Recreations Commission. The 32-year-old lawmaker told CBS LA online producer Deborah Marone <clears throat> that he promised voters while running for office that he would create more opportunities for undocumented residents. Illegal aliens. Huntington Park is a city of opportunity. Yeah, unless, of course, you're there legally, in which case you don't get the job. And a city of hope for all individuals, unless, of course, you were born there and raised there and worked your whole life to be part of the community, then you don't get the job. Regardless of social, economic status, race, creed, or the case state of citizenship, the councilman said in a statement. These gentlemen have accomplished a great deal for the city. If they accomplished so much, why aren't they legal? For that, on behalf of the city council mayor in our city, I want to thank them. I want to thank you and them both, and I am confident that they will do an excellent job on their commission posts. I am confident that if somebody doesn't sue that idiot and the entire council, that our country is absolutely lost. How's that? That's what I think. I, I don't care if you like it or not. Friends, you're listening to The Correct Views. Got three more stories to get to. I want to give a shout out to Sticker Junkie. See these stickers, Passing Time stickers. It's my band, and you can get a Passing Time sticker at thecorrectviews.hotmail.com. You can also get amazing stickers like these by going to stickerjunkie.com and letting David Lake know that you heard about it on The Correct View. Say, hey, David, Sam said I was going to get a discount if I mentioned it, and you will. Also, friends, look up the work of Mike McLaughlin, M-A-C-L-A-U-G-H-L-I-N. He is a writer. He uh, does poetry. He does a little bit of everything. If you really want to read some interesting stories, and want you contact him. Go right now, Mike McLaughlin. Go and let him know you heard about him on The Correct Views. You're really going to like the fiction he writes. And make sure you give a shout-out to TCV so he knows where you heard about it from. This, friends... How Uber threatens our way of life. Uber should be stopped because its CEO likes Ayn Rand. This is from Perbilon de Mises Daily. Let me tell you something before I get into this. 
the logic, and it's not, it's wrong, it's an incorrect view. The logic says that if you make <clears throat> the city in charge of who gets cab licenses, who can drive, how much insurance they have, and this and that, and this and that, if you do that, then it's going to be better for the people riding in the car, and it's going to be better for the driver. That's absolute hogwash. None of that is true. That's what everybody thinks, but none of it is true. I drove cab for almost nine years, so I'm going to let you know something I found out real quick. I worked for Yellow Cab, and yes, I will name names. Fred Nero is the greediest son of a bitch that ever lived. You, you an exuberant amount, like eight bucks an hour for your car. You buy your own gas. You have to get a vendor's license. You have to get a cab license. You know what that did? It sent the price of the fare through the roof. The city got a fortune. Fred Nero's greedy ass got a fortune. The driver starved to death, and the passenger got ripped off. Do you know what works? When Cosmo Transportation opened, shout out to Cosmo. They ran as a transportation company, which was a loophole, and didn't register with the city. They even had a Benz for it. I got to drive a Benz. Um, <clears throat> they had a Benz. They had regular vans. They had a little bit of everything. And the drivers made a lot more. The company was fine. It's, they're still around, Cosmo Transportation. My point being, the customer gets a better deal. And the driver, the driver get a better deal. I, you, you've heard me talk about change transportation. Call change transportation if you're in Canton. Let them know you heard about it from the correct views. Cheaper, brings prices down. Competitiveness. The city has no right to say anything. The city can shove it up their ass. They have no right to say anything. They've always got their hand out for something, always, wanting to charge you some licensing, some fees, some other crap. No right whatsoever. If you want to ride in a cab that's insured, then you can ride in a cab that's insured. No one's making you call an Uber cab. But if you call an Uber cab and they're not insured or they're underinsured, that is an agreement between you and them. The government, why do we need government in the backseat of every taxi? Other BS. Get the city out of it and get the person driving the car back in charge of it. What if he's driving drunk? We already have DUI laws. If he's driving drunk, you take his license away. You take license away when they're not drunk. They do it every day. It's called a DUI. Most people that get DUIs are perfectly healthy. That's another, that's another discussion. Perfectly sober, I mean. But listen to this. The online tech and science magazine Verge uh, recently published an essay on the economic and political impact of disruptive ride-sharing upstart Uber. Uber can't be stopped, so what happens next? Well, I'll tell you what happens next. People do what my friend Mike Zinn did. I've known Mike my whole life. I saw him like seventh grade. I saw him today. And guess what? He owns A1 Express. Call it. Watch the prices go down from the ones that are uh, up the city's ass. Mark my words. Whereas one might expect an online tech magazine like Verge itself part of a wave of disruptive publishing efforts to be optimistic about the innovative tech initiatives, the essay offers a surprisingly bleak, pessimistic, and politicized analysis. Let me tell you another thing real quick here. And this is something a lot of, uh, a lot of people don't realize. When I was with a reputable cab company, and we were able to park at the airport. They charge you for the license to sit there, so the airport makes money. More money to put their hands down your pants, as Alex Jones would say. They're not safer. God forbid, and I, I'm, I hope it never happens, anybody driving a cab for a reputable service can pull up in front of the airport with a bomb, God forbid. It's not safer. It's just an excuse for the airport to take money. That's all it is. It says, apparently, Verge sees the problems with Uber's challenging of the privileged and guide-based taxi business. And I just told you how that gets ripped off. The driver makes nothing. 
Rather than discussing what Uber offers the market for per person transportation, the author discusses the problems involved with Uber having a monopoly situation. It's a very strange perspective on the issue, considering how Uber is challenging the legal privilege of licensed taxi corporations. Exactly, and that's as it should be. And in the age of social media, we got all kinds, they call them jitneys, of people that say, if you need a ride, call me, I'll give you a ride. The government's never going to be able to shut that down, and to hell with them if they try. The recent and still ongoing struggle in cities like St. Louis, Missouri, who needs to stay the hell out of their business, offers a good illustration. The city won't allow Uber to compete with taxi and refers to the industry-based regulatory body called the Metropolitan Taxi Commission, which can go to hell, which consists mostly of representatives from existing companies. Needless to say, the MTC has been uncooperative, so they, they form a monopoly and then call Uber a monopoly. A similar example was in Columbia, Missouri, where a local political elite could find no regulatory solutions to the Uber challenge. Instead, the city postponed the decision and publicly stated that Uber was illegal due to proper regulation. The lack of regula regulation, of course, was sufficient reason for local police to conduct sting operations against Uber drivers. Well, you learn how to use social media better. The political response to Uber is expected in both practice and rhetoric. The potential disruption that Uber offers by challenging existing guilds head-on and by offering consumers better and cheaper services, yes, more prompt, less money, is supposedly harmful because it's unregulated. Why do we need the government regulating our taxi service? Get the hell out of our taxi service. How's that? It's not a level playing field, and therefore the entry of Uber into the overly regulated market is unfair. The Verge essay takes the sides with the political elites in this, in many other cities, the author of the aforementioned essay, a Ben Popper, makes the same claims about a level playing field and implied unfairness by competing with legally privileged guilds. But he goes a little further by claiming the regulatory trump card monopoly. Uber, we are told, is a problem because it is so much bigger than competing app-based ride-sharing companies like Lyft. It has a monopoly. That's not true at all. They're just more successful. And as Lyft gets more successful, their apps will be out there just as much when they can afford to do it like Uber has done. It burns my ass to see this. Who would be in favor of the government deciding everything? It's ridiculous. The problem of monopoly is supposedly that it harms people. Oh, no, I hate when pages are fresh. InfoWars, why would you do that? The problem of monopoly is supposedly that it harms consumers who, under monopoly, are not offered a sufficient number of choices and therefore are forced to pay too high prices as producers can demand payment above the market price. This makes it very difficult to understand the author's argument, but it seems to say that Uber's challenging of the existing privileged guilds by offering a non-guild alternative is harmful to consumers because they are very few similar challenges to the guilds. That doesn't make any sense. It says Uber offers better services to lower prices should be at the very core of what we mean by competition. That is not a monopoly. It has been proven to be enough of a benefit to consumers. After all, a great many consumers choose to ride with Uber drivers instead of traditional companies for reasons that I just told you. The Uber thereby disrupts a privileged and corrupt industry and an added benefit, but Diverge will have none of it. Let me tell you what ripping off the uh, cab drivers do. I'm, I'm a pretty honest person. I mean, I'm not like a saint or anything, but I'm a pretty honest person. When I drove cab, I used to have to go out of my way to find drug dealers so that I could take them from point A to point B, because if I didn't, my wife wasn't going to get to eat that night. Because my lease was so high, I'd, there weren't enough regular fares, and Fred's Nero's greedy ass was ripping me off. You would pray that prostitutes ran. God, God only knows, I hope none, how many people have probably got AIDS because of some prostitute needing a ride somewhere. And I went out of my way to find her, to take her to him. That's, what, that's, what, that's the kind of crap you get into when you're stuck paying outrageous lease for the regular guilds. It brings crime into your city. 
Uh, you don't see that from independent cab drivers so much because they're not out scooting around. They're waiting for their, their cell phone to ring. So don't tell me it makes you safer. I worked in this industry for almost a decade. It makes it much worse because the driver has to do any and everything in order just to eat. You'd work eight hours, you'd make $25, $30. Says the problem is apparently that the inefficient status quo is challenged, but the arguments were offered tend to be smears more than arguments. Apart from the very strange view of a monopoly, the author notes the tragic rape incident in India. He even quotes Hillary Clinton's expressed concern over workplace protections and what a good job will look like in the future. Apparently, what she said makes a lot of sense to Popper. In the same sense, as added competition in the industry means a monopoly. <clears throat> Again, you mean no no cab driver has ever raped anybody except the Uber driver? I, I would venture to say that that's not true. Perhaps, the writer says, I'm overly sensitive to economic fallacies presented as truths. Um, we should be wary of Uber, who has so far flouted almost all attempts at regulation. He's being uh, tongue-in-cheek here. The bottom line is, any time the, the little man starts to get some money away from the, the big companies, you start hearing about safety and regulation. I can tell you, regulation did nothing but make me a dishonest, poor person. And once I got out of that and into a company like Cosmo that was run by a really good people, Glenn Holcomb, how you doing? Wonderful people. Wonderful, good people. Uh, hard-working people. We all made money. And it uh, it was not in one of the reg recognized guilds. So don't listen to that. Call Uber. Or better yet, call your local cab company. I gave you a few here. All right, friends, the two stories to get to. We're going a little bit long, but it's fine. Adorable new species of peacock spider discovered. This is awesome. This is where I wish I had uh, Adobe Premiere, the uh, new one, the CS6, because I'd be able to put these graphics up. It's got a blue face with like four great big googly eyes, maybe more than that, and it's it's a beautiful, I mean, it's a spider, but it's absolutely beautiful. It's uh, blonde, black, and white. It's absolutely gorgeous, and it's a new spider that they've discovered. Peacock spiders may be deservedly renowned for their flashy flaps that can make any lady weak in her eight knees, but this newly discovered species is showing that you don't have to be bold to be beautiful. Belonging to the growing list of 44 jumping spiders, uh, Christelle owns a jumping spider, it's, it's pinky. In the emeritus genus, the species new to science actually came to light a few years ago. But when spider expert David Knowles luckily stumbled upon it. But documenting these teeny dancers is no mean feat, given the fact that they are only a few millimeters in length. So it took a while to track it down in order to confirm it classified as a new species. In other words, it's not likely to hurt anybody. It's very, very, very small, but it's gorgeous. In the end, our resident peacock spider man, Jurgen Otto, came to the rescue. And we can thank him for the glorious collection of photographs he captured, which I'm telling you, go to uh, iflscience.com and see these. As you can see, males uh, don a rather seductive blue mask in order to entice potential lady friends. The striking feature is served as inspiration for its name, M. personatus, which is derived from the Latin word for masked, according to New Scientist. Uh, you can find uh, <clears throat> more pictures on his Flickr page. Flickr. I'm on Tumblr. Nobody's on that. I bet you even less people are on Flickr. Well, peacock spiders may have earned their name from the most psychedelic fans worn by many, they are actually quite a few lacking these dazzling discs. So you want to go and check it out. It's it's. I don't want to bore everybody to death that doesn't care about the science stuff, but this kind of stuff fascinates me. And he is... He really is a gorgeous creature. There's also one here that's translucent. You can actually see inside of it. You can see like the eggs in it. Not necessarily beautiful on that one, but if you're like I am, it's awesome cool. Alright guys, that brings us to the dum dee dum dee dum dee of the day. Where's my dum dee music? I need it. I need it. I can't go without my dum dee music. Oh... Oh, there it is. 
We got a dumpty, friends. We got a big dumpty. All right. Uh, guys, targets, targets, targets. I love uh, Target. I, I picked Target over Walmart for my, uh, my um, wedding uh, registry. And uh, my wife picked uh, Walmart just because she had to, because her family's in the country, and Walmarts are there is all there is within thirty miles. They're kind of just trapped. But I, I again, I encouraged everyone to do Target if at all possible, if they chose to do anything. Well, now, while still better than Walmart, Target has won the Dumdy of the day. Target ditches gender labels on toys, home, and entertainment. The bigger picture here is that they're uh, they're saying oh, we need to be more inclusive of uh, of uh, sexism and uh, basically they don't want to offend the parents of uh, you know Billy and Bob or something living together they don't want the uh, they don't want the uh, parents to be offended by gender labeling. Well, I'll tell you what this is gonna do. It's going to confuse the hell out of uh, the 70-year-old grandparent that's trying to figure out which superhero the kid wants. Like, a boy could quite possibly want a Princess Leia Star Wars figure. And that would be labeled as boys. Now Granny Gert's going to be utterly lost at Christmas time. That's what's going to happen. <clears throat> For that reason, they get the dumb deal of the day. Target is ditching boys and girls labels on their toys after the store says customers are raising concerns about unnecessary gender-based signs. Get the hell out of the store, you bastards. In a statement posted on their website on Friday, Target announced that they were moving away from gendered signs in stores. How very stupid of them. Over the past year, guests have raised important questions about a handful of signs in our stores that offer suggestions based on gender. Molly Snyder, a spokesman for Target, told NBC News the ways that people shop are continually evolving and changing, and we tried to look at what makes sense and what doesn't work. So they took the labeling off of the, we heard you, they said, and we agree. Right now, our teams are working across the store to identify areas where we can phase out gender-based signage to help strike a better balance. You can strike a better balance in hell. That's the stupid.